welcome everyone to this uh, uh, further event uh, COP, COP U uh, is bringing to you eco justice today. How can we harness the power of the law and the collective power of the workforce to secure just transition? And today we have as guests uh, Declan Owens and Nicholas Pure. Nicholas is a fellow lecturer at the University of Essex and his research focuses on the politics of climate change, transition to a low carbon economy and climate justice. Uh, he previously worked on a number of campaigns focusing on securing the, the UK's Climate Change Act, factory farming, uh, the livestock industry, climate migration and international COP process that is very much uh, the, the topic of these days. Uh, because COP is uh, now ongoing. And Declan is a trade union and environmental lawyer. He's been setting up the Good Justice Legal Action Center and he's also uh, uh, contributed to um, Eco Justice Ireland to work with trade unions and local communities. He's also chair of Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. So today they will give us an idea of how we can um, uh, support collect collective action uh, to achieve eco justice, climate and ecological justice, that is. And um, they will also touch upon different aspects of, of this topic from uh, the, the, the uh, role of workforce to the uh, role of different international forces in the, uh, the uh, decarbonization. So the transition to uh, to a new uh, economy, to a new uh, system, possibly in a just fashion. So I leave it to them. Uh, probably, who's going to start first? Nicholas, do you want to start first, or Declan? I think Declan nominated me, so I think I'm going first. Okay, there you go then. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's always fun to talk about. It's good to talk about just transitions rather than talking about catastrophes. This makes a nice change. Um, I didn't I haven't prepared sort of a formal talk, but more a series of sketch of ideas. And I figured um, leave a bit more space for interaction, uh, which is unlikely at this stage, but we'll see how we go, maybe amongst ourselves. I wanted to sort of start off. And I think I don't and I don't know where uh, Declan and I haven't had a chance to chat before prior to this, and so hopefully. Um, our talks work well in parallel. I want to sort of sketch out a few ideas around what I think the conditions for um, the working class will be going through the transition to a low carbon economy or a green economy, or let's just name it as green capitalism. That's where we're headed at the moment. And it, we had a, you guys were talking just before we started off class and maybe how it appeals to young people, it doesn't appeal to young people. I don't think it's ever appealed, you know, it hasn't appealed as much as it does now for generations. I think we're dealing with a, we're in a period of time where capitalism is quite obvious and apparent to people, and people are quite comfortable talking about capitalism, particularly young people. And the same is increasingly so for class. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what Declan thinks about that. I think it's important to talk about class and to foreground class in terms of a transition to a low carbon economy, mostly because of the way that, um, the narrative of transitions being sold to us. Now, overwhelmingly, when we talk about you know, transforming the global economy or even the UK economy, we talk about two things overwhelmingly. The first are a series of targets. And so we have pledges and we have targets and we have you know, parts per million or carbon emissions or any number of targets for reducing our carbon emissions. Now, all government policy or business activity is built around these targets. They're all built around meeting, meeting and reaching these targets. That's often put in conjunction with uh, an often Guardian newspaper led campaign to get us to reduce our consumption. So we have consumption as a focus and we have targets as a focus. And the reason I think it's interesting, it, it's important that we talk about the working class is that that's left out of the picture entirely. Any sort of justice in transforming our economy is left as almost a, an afterthought in a, or an addition to the necessary task of reducing our carbon emissions. Now, I think in terms of a framework 
that's a useful starting point because what sort of it sets up a um, it's that sort of framing that sort of government targets and our excess consumption driving the climate crisis sets up a framework where we end up with the whole jobs versus the environment debate you now it's it's often we talk about jobs versus the environment as though it was an illusion or it wasn't real or it wasn't a conflict you know it was a conflict manufactured by the the Murdoch press or the Tories or the rest of it I actually think it's a, a consequence of the way that we approach the problem of climate change we deal with it as a problem of excess consumption in the global north it's important to say that we're talking about the global north and inadequate pledges or targets or programs to reduce our emissions so we, we kind of set it up as though we have the environment on one hand and the other hand we have these processes that we need to modify in order to reach it and that's sort of a loss of jobs or a change in the conditions of work it's kind of like a consequence of reducing our emissions it's like an afterthought one of the problems with that as an approach is that justice or a just transition will always be a, a secondary concern First of all, we have the necessary changes we need to make to our economy. And on the other hand, we have, well, what does that mean? We have like a fallout for the transition for the world of work. So what I want to suggest is that when we talk about workers' struggles or the role of workers' struggles in a just transition, we need to sort of decenter the role of consumption in our analysis. And we need to move away from the question of targets. I mean, both of these sound, sound possibly counterintuitive. But what I want to suggest is that when it comes down to the average person's daily life, the thing that will change the most in the transition to a low carbon economy is their job. The reason I want to say that is actually, if you look at what most the average person spends their money on, 70 to 80% of that is on their mortgage or their rent. It's on food, it's on clothing, it's on utilities, it's on getting to and from work. Most of it's most of what people spend their money on are basically essentials. Now, the framework of those essentials, we can sort of ha have arguments around uh, livestock production versus cereal production, home insulation, heat pumps, and all the rest of it. But most of that is people making the best decisions they can on a limited budget, a budget that we have to you know, acknowledge has reduced year on year as real wages have stalled or declined. Most people's consumption only contributes to climate change insofar as they're given a series of bad choices. I mean, it's, people have no real power of the, at the point of consumption in general over climate change. When we talk about consumption, usually what happens is that all that essential stuff that we have to buy gets bundled in with business flights or yachts or ski trips or whatever other crap that rich people do with their time. You know, we bundle in together luxury consumption by a small number of people with our everyday consumption. Then we treat it as though that's the problem. We treat consumption as the problem. Now, it's worth noting the concept of the carbon footprint was invented by BP. It was invented by an oil company as a deliberate sort of attempt to obscure the responsibility for climate change. The whole idea of ethical consumption and all the rest of it, it's, it's a nice idea. It's a nice idea for people who overwhelmingly have a high disposable income that they can spend on Aga heaters and SUVs and the rest of it. But that's not really what most of us spend our money on a day to day level. So when I talk about work being the main thing that will change is that that's in terms of what we spend our time doing, that's going to be the main experience we have of climate change or the transition is not maybe we have a bit less red meat, maybe we use more public transport, maybe our cars are electric, maybe our house is better insulated, but overwhelmingly our life will change because our work will change. Now, the reason I started out talking about green capitalism and or the transition to a low carbon economy is that we have to also understand that the transition's underway now. We're not, we're no longer fighting, well, unless you're in a recalcitrant country, a country like Australia or Saudi Arabia, you're not fighting for the country to transition to a low carbon economy. It's underway in most of the large emitting countries. Most of the countries that count in terms of emissions or the production of CO2, a transition of some kind is underway. Now, what's happening to that transition, what we're talking about is a series of measures, investment measures overwhelmingly, to reduce emissions in certain sectors. So 
housing insulation, heat pumps, renewable energy, electric vehicles. Now, it's important to note that most of what's happening is the sort of the, the greening of existing forms of work. You know, what they're trying to do is try to take what we have and reduce the emissions. Now, this has two consequences that are really important in terms of you know, what work we do and how it's done. The first is that in terms of dissatisfaction of work, in terms of bullying or violence at work, in terms of overwork or underemployment, in terms of not having enough time to and not enough work you know, in order to meet your needs, zero hour contracts through to gig economy, that's not being transformed into something just or sustainable for people's lives. It's just being greened. So the first consequence of the plan that the government, this government currently has, and many other governments currently have, is they're just greening shit jobs and terrible conditions for the most part. Now, under the guise of wanting to reduce emissions, transforming jobs and sort of to ensure that they're just or improving conditions are seen as an impediment, particularly because of the approach that the government's taken. The, the approach the government's taken is to try to attract private investment private investment that's then matched with government by public funds to ensure that private companies build out the transition of our green infrastructure. Now, this is where the jobs versus environment, for, like the first sweep through that comes in. The idea that you can have good quality jobs, jobs that pay well, that provide security, is put up as a barrier to the kinds of investment that the government's trying to attract. And you know, it's their approach to use, you know, to track private funding that sets up the jobs versus environment conflict. If, you know, car workers in Merseyside put up too much of a struggle around the conditions in the Nissan plant, you know, maybe they want to kick up a fuss that, you know, for all the, the 900 new jobs the government announced that there's a, a problem with the fact that they sacked one and a half thousand people over the last five years, that will be seen as a barrier to the green investment. You could see that across a number of industries in terms of retraining. So the North Sea um, oil workers are being told they have to pay for their own retraining. If they kicked up a fuss and said that you know, business should pay for it, that would also be seen as a barrier to green investment. So the first sweep through the jobs versus environment problem is that union struggles and worker struggles are being touted as a, a, a cost barrier, an investment barrier to building out the sort of green infrastructure that we need. Now, if this is the game in town, if emissions have to be reduced, then either these workers accept the, the, the lowering of the conditions or accept that their struggles have to take second priority or the green investment goes elsewhere. So thinking that we can talk about jobs versus the environment as a, as a product of the government's plan to effectively give 26 billion pounds to private companies to build green infrastructure to essentially solve their production processes. So that's jobs and environment in, you know, environment in, the, first, in the first round. And it also gives you a sense that how government and industry will lead, like, leverage our struggles against us. They'll say, well, if you struggle, then you know, not only are you, you holding back the transition to the low carbon economy, is that we just won't build it here, we'll build it somewhere else. The second step is, and I think this is a, a difficult, difficult one in terms of figuring out a way to cut through is that we're in a situation at a global level where the global economy is relatively stagnant and has been in terms of capacity for years that what's built out sort of you know driven sort of investment and growth has largely been sort of um, a handful of like large economies primarily China sort of building out their urban infrastructure and their productive capacity. The consequence being is that we're in a world of wash with productive capacity. We have more capacity to produce everything from cars to steel to wind turbines than we actually need, you know, if you did it at a global level. There is, at the moment, and it's playing out at an international level, a competition between national governments to attract funding. So not only is there uh, a jobs versus environment sort of issue in terms of you know sort of plant like sort of national programs of moving towards net zero. 
At a global level, there's a competition between countries to attract scarce capital, on the understanding that there's, an in, in, there's too much productive capacity. That means in a, a regional sense that we could end up quite easily in a jobs versus the environment sort of condition where we have um, national governments, particularly ones like the, the UK government that like to play the, the racist and xenophobic nationalist card, trying to co-opt unions and workers on the side of national sort of campaigns of economic protectionism. We could find ourselves in a situation where we end up with Brexit 2.0, sort of a re, re up on the sort of Tory nationalism and dog whistle sort of politics around racism. The reason I think this is another part of the jobs versus environment problem is that one possible outcome to the current transition is that every country builds out green infrastructure, every country builds out green productive capacity. And that given that you can't entirely green every industrial process, there's always like a 20% left over in terms of emissions that people want to offset. You could end up with a paradoxical situation where you have too much green infrastructure and productive capacity to actually meet your climate targets. That does bring us back to the, to the idea of overconsumption, but it's not really an overconsumption problem. So what we're talking about- Sorry, Nick, can you, can, can you please uh, expand on, on this last thing you said, because, because it's counterintuitive. So I think it might be useful to spend a few more words on that. It wasn't that clear to me. So we end up with more infrastructure, you said. All right. So the, the, the idea would be so say every country follows the same thing. So the UK government's line of investing billions in, say, green steel. Green steel would be a classic example. You can, the only way you can get steel production down to net zero carbon emissions is ultimately, and this is in every single you know, steel plan is have offset some of the emissions. So using arc, um, arc like furnaces and renewable energy and all you know, green mining processes, if such a thing exists, there's only so much you can do to reduce the emissions from the steel sector. Almost every single plan to make steel net zero involves offsetting at least some of the emissions. Like most companies will say they need to offset about 15 to 20% of their emissions. Now, if every country wants to build out its own sort of green steel industry, if it wants to do that in terms of securing its place at a particular part, you know, sort of a particular part of the sort of the value hierarchy in terms of global production chains and global industry, it wants to secure investment, wants to secure economic activity, and ultimately it wants to secure some jobs, even though it may not want those jobs to be unionized or particularly militant. Now, if every country does that, you'll end up with, you know, 15, 20% of emissions is, is not zero. And there's only so much offsetting you can do. There's literally not enough space already to plant trees, to build non-existent carbon capture and storage in, infrastructure on the rest of it. You can't offset that 15 to 20%. You certainly can't offset it if everybody builds it out. So if you have a protectionist race to build out green infrastructure, you could paradoxically end up with far too much infrastructure for the requirements that we have. There's also an argument to be made that if anywhere should be building out new infrastructure, it should be countries in the global south, not those in the north. Now, one of the reasons I said it's paradoxical is that it's also not in workers' interests. You, know, you could come back to the first two points that they're going to be told again and again and again that they're in competition with people from other countries, that they're in, you know, if they're militancy or their struggles or their, their demand for decent conditions and good pay is a blockage to investment. So you know, we can see this sort of this not only being a, an excess build out at a global scale, we can see it being used against workers to further reduce their bargaining power. I think, but it, just as an example, it gets us to the core of the problem. Like I said, at the beginning, often this gets framed as a question of targets and overconsumption, whereas targets in themselves are not necessarily bad, but the problem is overproduction, not overconsumption. And parent, like it's one of those questions that often we get told that, you know, either you invest in green jobs or you see them go elsewhere. You know, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have economic growth, if you don't have build a economic infrastructure, then you know it's workers that lose out. But at the same time, 
this race to build out more and more infrastructure doesn't benefit workers necessarily at the other end either. So I think we end up, one of the reasons we need to talk about the working class is that we need to put work at the center of it. But where we are now is a situation where workers are an afterthought. They're secondary to the plans of building infrastructure. They're secondary to the plans of reducing carbon emissions. In the end, it's when they count, it's only in terms of consumption that they count at all, reducing their consumption. Now, we need to green infrastructure. We also need to reduce emissions. Ultimately, and we know this, this is now relatively well established, the only way to do that is to reduce the amount of resources that we're making use of at a world scale. Reduce the amount of energy that we need, reduce the amount of materials that go through the production process. Now, there are ways to do that in a, a more labor intensive rather than machinery and capital intensive way. So we, we can start to reduce the amount that we produce without necessarily reducing the amount of workers involved in the process. If we listen to workers who are involved in these processes, if we actually start to institute a democracy at a shop floor level, at a economic level, something that's escaped us for the last 150 years of democracy. Democracy ends at the factory door or the office door. We have no democracy in the workplace. For, as David Graeber would say, for 16 hours a day, we're free and for eight hours a day, we're slaves. We start to induce democracy and ask the people who know best, we could start to reduce the capital intensity of industry. We could start to reduce the amount of material throughput or even the amount of, that we produce without reducing the amount of workers that we have. That would get us some of the way there without infringing on the, the rights and interests of workers. But I think we also need to start asking the question of, is work everything that we want it to be? And I think I'm not gonna go much longer than this, I just wanna say, I think it's instructive that the great acceleration, so the ex massive explosion in the resources that we use and the environmental damage we, we in the global north, in, the, the economies of the global north inflict on the world, really started only after workers stopped reducing their working day. Like, you know, we were, as a class, struggling to reduce the working day up until the end of the 1940s. It was at eight hours, and there were campaigns for six-hour days, there were campaigns for four-hour days in the 1940s, late 1940s. It's only after that, after the compromise between business state and big unions, that we started to connect wages to productivity connect our well-being to ever more production and capacity. Workers' struggles had been for a good 80 years connected to, or 100 years connected to reducing the amount of time we spent working. And it's interesting in the US at the moment, they've got what they call the great refusal. I don't know if people have been paying attention to it. People just re refusing to do jobs for minimum wage and for terrible bosses in terrible conditions. And it's been said that this is a, it's not just a moment, it's sort of a, a a broader reappraisal of work, that the pandemic has paradoxically enabled people to look at work, to see the conditions of the work and say, no, this is fuck. Okay, we see this around, you know, we've seen it episodically around struggles to of what factories produce, sort of what conditions people want, people refusing to drive trucks, you know, come to the UK and pick fruit and gangs. I think we like I think the reappraisal of how much work we do and how we do it is well overdue. And I think I'll end with this is I think if we are going to confront the transition, then we need to start taking seriously the two questions of how much work we do and under what conditions we do it. Because if we just accept that work is going to change and that we follow the dictates of investment, in the, so the dictates of emissions reductions without putting work front and center, then the transition will only end up taking us somewhere that maybe there are fewer emissions, but our daily lives are no better. If anything, they're probably worse. I'll end it there. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, lots of questions I had in my mind, but uh, I, I, I refrain to uh, to ask you anything, and I'll just pass it to Declan uh, so that he can he can contribute to this very interesting discussion. Thank you, and um, thanks, Nicholas. Um, I wouldn't disagree with a word that you said, and I'm not afraid to um, describe myself as a socialist lawyer. Indeed, I'm co-chair of the Haldian Society of Socialist Lawyers, so 
very much <clears throat> the case that the class analysis is correct. And I think that the role of collective action is key to achieving eco justice. Now, by eco justice, I would say that that includes an appreciation of the urgency and scale of climate change and biodiversity loss, because in a way they, they come together. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about the, the history of the, the concept of a just transition and then allude to my experience working for the ITUC um, International Trade Union Confederation and the International Labour Organization for the Workers Bureau and how, <clears throat> how that's informed my view of um, the action that needs to be taken. So to start with a short history, um, I think we need to go back to the Industrial Revolution and look at the way militancy sought to protect workers and communities um, with things like um, air pollution. And then the phrase of just transition itself was coined in the US by um, a trade unionist who was a, the leader of the oil, chemical and atomic workers union. And he worked to bring trade unionists into the, the ban, the bomb peace movement alongside a campaign to protect workers in the transition to nuclear disarmament. And then you, you have this period where I, I agree with Nicholas, there's this concept of corporatism or the compromise between capital labor and national governments that manifests itself in the sustainable development goals in 2015. And working for the ITUC, I definitely find that the, the, the leadership were um, triangulating at every stage with um, the organizer, the, the, um, the, the organization on behalf of employers, and then, you know, necessarily the ILO guidelines for just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all. These guidelines were a triangulation. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because, you know, th those guidelines are above and beyond what we see in the UK and much of the, the Western world, and they, they're seeking to bring up the standard of living of the, the global south, but it, it's not sufficient. It, it really isn't for, for all the reasons Nicholas um, talked about. But this movement in, in around 2015, the just transition did manifest in the preamble to the Paris Agreement where um, it was said that taking into account the imperatives of the just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. This, this was included in the preamble and there, there is scope to um, develop that because the, the ILO guidelines and they're transposed um, or not transposed in the case of the UK um, in different ways throughout the world. And this sort of caveat in relation to the stage of development that each country is at is, is problematic in, in terms of the way in which workers in the global south are um, constrained by the conditions of global capital. But the, the ILO guidelines focus on the rights at work in, in theory, which include the right to freedom of association and critically the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining. And according to the ILO and the ITUC, social dialogue is at the, at the core of the just transition. But as, as we know in, in Britain, there's virtually no social dialogue. Although interestingly, during the pandemic, um, there was an enhanced role for the TUC where they, they basically pushed um, for the furlough scheme and, and that was in an emergency situation. But, you know, as we know, if, if governments can take action at the scale that they did during the pandemic, the climate emergency can be taken as seriously because, again, as Nicholas said, we're, we're living through it now. So the other aspect of the ILO guidelines is um, social protection, you know, ranging from healthcare to income security, old age, unemployment, sickness, invalidity, work injury, maternity, or the loss of a main income earner. And all of that is, is important to sort of provide the 
the context in which a just transition can take place. And the, the, the ITUC has a number of demands and they range across to, you know, the workers in fossil fuel industries um, protecting that, that transition through retraining, redeployment and um, pensions for older workers and investi investing in, um, in community renewal is, is recognized as a key concept. And I'll come on to that later in so far as my own work um, is concerned. But the, the technological aspect of the transition, again, the, the ITUC have triangulated according to the um, processes that government and capital have identified, and, and that's that's problematic. And you know, I was interested in the analysis that Nicholas had because consumption is an issue. So, in a way, we're, we're talking about ownership of the means of consumption as opposed or in combination with ownership of the means of production. And that, that is a, an, an eco-socialist sort of approach. But also when one thinks about the capital approach to consumption, it's facilitated by the monopolies on um, the social media giants and the internet giants where their, their whole um, premise is based on advertising and the way in which Google, Facebook have their whole, um, their, their whole, income base used on, on, on the way in which um, we all consume too much and advertising facilitates that. So I, I was definitely interested in that contradiction that Nicholas identified. But continuing on with the way the ITUC sees the just transition, you know, they, they do want um, investment in decent work and, and that follows from the ILO guidelines and um, social protection and then social dialogue in, in every country and, and then social dialogue underpins the collective nature of social um, action by workers and, and that should go into the workplace and, and that should be um, democracy at work and you know workers collective action is, is key to that so <clears throat> you know you, you have to look at the macro economic um, policies um, which includes sectoral policies. And we've lost the tradition of um, <clears throat> sectoral collective bargaining and um, national collective bargaining, which um, although a compromise um, for the corporatist agenda after the Second World War was effective in, in reducing inequality. Um, and interestingly, Unite under the, the new leadership of um, Sharon Graham are focusing again on, on the, the leverage that different sectors can bring to bear in the, in the fight for a just transition. Um, but it also involves enterprise policies by governments and skills development um, and, and recognizing, you know, occupational health and safety relates again to um, climate justice, whether it's again air pollution or the, the way in which green reps can um, hold the, the processes of, of production of various um, employers to account. Um, so I think the, the idea of social dialogue and tripartism has its place in the transition, but basically it's not, it's not sufficient. So in, in my view, um, having worked with the ITUC and the ILO, I, I sort of felt that the, the concept of just transition included working on a, a local, regional, national and international basis. And, and that's what I do as a lawyer. So um, I, I think when, whenever you look at a just transition um, and traditionally the, the contrast is with the, the miners in um, Britain and the, the way in which their communities were devastated by the lack of planning and the lack of a just transition. I, I think that communities are at the heart of it. And in terms of the processes of achieving that, um, th there is a way in which we can reconceive the relationship that we have of nature. And this is where, you know, I think eco justice is a better concept than climate justice, because 
there, there's a growing movement to secure rights of nature as a legal concept. <clears throat> so that would mean um, a mountain could sue a mining company, for example, <clears throat> or um, an ocean could, could sue um, oil exploration. There's, there's a way in which um, that legal personhood could um, sort of turn the concept of the limited company on its head because a limited company is a legal fiction um, that supports the development of capitalism. And the development of the rights of nature um, has secured at least um, rhetorically um, a resolution on the, the recognition and implementation of a human right to a clean, safe, healthy environment by the Human Rights Council. So from a legal perspective, there is scope to develop this, but my view is that <clears throat> um, we, we must look outside the law and I have limited respect for a legal system that was developed um, to facilitate capitalism at the height of the Industrial Revolution and many of the, the legal precepts and underpinning remain. So, you know, law is, is a social um, tool used for for you know justice that that um you know is part of this a strategy particularly by the, the trade union movement where collective bargaining is um is a different norm from um the legal norms and sits sort of in a in a relationship with the law but slightly outside of it because it's seen as a in gender terms, a, a gentleman's agreement, but that that um, <clears throat> is, a, is officially within the UK deemed to be something which is um, a breach of contract, and you basically have an exemption from breach of contract as opposed to a right um, to collective bargaining or a right to strike, which you know is ridiculous in and of itself. But one of the ways in which to facilitate the the linking of community action and collective community action and campaigns in different parts of the country is to look at the Our House Convention where um, it facilitates public participation in environmental decision making and the, the right of everyone to receive environmental information that is held by public authorities and then from a legal perspective again it, it guarantees access to justice and cost capping whenever um, communities are um, in litigation with um, or organ, organizations of um, employers. So I, I brought this right back um, to acting on the local, regional, national and international level with the, the way that I've evolved in terms of my understanding and practice of the law. So I, I've set up the Eco Justice Legal Action Center, which um, will take action on behalf of unions and workers against um, corporations and national governments. And um, I brought that down to the local level with Equal Justice Ireland. I, I re relocated from London to, you know, achieve a sort of um, confluence of, of consciousness where I'm, I'm living by a nature reserve um, and I can work locally, regionally within the, the North of Ireland and nationally within the island of Ireland and then internationally I, I work with the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and that's an organization which is um, the sort of collective of radical lawyers throughout the world and, and I produced a legal submission for COP26 and um, I, I feel that that all facilitates the way in which we can act collectively um, and through a way in which um, workers and their communities can interact together. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Stefan. This is very, very interesting. And embedding the expertise in the field of law within the community and to increase uh, awareness. I think that the events we, we have uh, today is, uh, in my opinion, is really containing the, the two most important uh, core aspects of um, of potential system change. And on one end is the the power of law that we might be able to use against uh, the elites, that's where the corporations and governments at the moment. 
they seem to work together. And on the other hand, the workforce that I think is the most difficult aspect at the moment, in my understanding, we really need to increase the awareness on one hand, tell the workers that, you know, they, they fight for eco justice and the, the role of um, the climate and the ecological emergency is at the core of the changes that need to come uh, in, the, in the future years. And, and the fact that the workforce is actually, to some extent, at least in, in my perception, neglecting this problem. Uh, most of my colleagues, at least in my experience, they, they sort of dismiss uh, this aspect as part of the, the, the um, their daily practice or the daily uh, aspect of uh, their involvement in the industrial relationship. And um, and I think also to some extent the unions themselves, even though UCU, the, the union, we are part of the uh, union that is, um, uh, uh, that is uh, protecting uh, academics and uh, professional services at the university um, is 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 one of those that's more uh, active uh, to this respect. I think is still not as focused on the the the, the role of the climate and, and ecological crisis as central aspect of the fight and uh, central aspect of the industrial relations. So I see a problem in, in putting the eco-justice eco -justice at the center of the uh, industrial fights. Uh, I see a problem in mobilizing workforce and, and making them understand how this is crucial because as Nicola said, um, there is a trade-off that has been uh, put forth by uh, the, the leadership that if you if you want uh, changes that are um, for the environment, then you're gonna then you're gonna you're gonna have less uh, in terms of uh, satisfying your rights in the, in the workplace. Um, so yeah, I, I, I struggle to put together um, these things. And when also, also when Nicola said, uh, we have a problem with overproduction, not with overconsumption. Um, I agree that we have a problem with overproduction, but I also mm -hmm. feel that we have a problem with overconsumption and the people have been uh, literally raised in this uh, culture of overconsumption, and then all of a sudden you ask them to consume less. Uh, I don't think if you start producing less, then they they will still, you know, they will comply and consume less regardless. So I mean, I'm putting this there just for for discussion. Uh, I don't know if James wants to add anything else. Feel free to. To answer as well, Nicholas. I just wanted to jump in on the. Um, I suppose just just want to make two quick points. I think. I think in the first instance that we have to like. I think what I what I, uh, I think it came out through Declan's talk really well is that. We have to like sort of in some sense we need to talk about in who in whose interests you know I think that was really nicely made in terms of like yeah you know, there's lots of different interests at stake in terms of. You know we can talk about oceans and rivers and people and workers and consumers and all, all the rest of it but i think for my mind the, the the tension between jobs and the environment is often it's a question of i wouldn't say complicity but of workers interests being treated as secondary to the interests of industry whether it's industry in transition or industry as it is I, i'll just give you a quick example so i live on the river stow so i live in the countryside and the River Stour, where I am, I'm just outside of Colchester, like every weekend, you know, the working class from the region get their kayaks or their paddle boards or just come swimming in the river. And there's a huge number of people come swimming in the river. 
like to the point where the rivers are choked with people, everyone's out there enjoying the countryside. And the working class around here are always in the countryside. You know, this is, you know, they enjoy it as much as anybody else. Now that, that river, every time it rains, gets flushed with sewage. Like, so there's a direct relationship between the interests of the working class in this region and the health of the river and the health of the environment. They're the ones who get sick, they're the ones who suffer. When we talk, I think the, we need to emphasize overproduction because it's, we already, as we all know, there's an endless number of ways, even at a really simple level, we could reduce the inefficiencies and wastes of production processes that, are, that exist. Let's be clear, these, the waste exists because it's cheap and it makes it cheap to produce things. We could fix those inefficiencies and reduce massively the impact of most industrial processes on the environment. It just drives up the cost of production. I think the worker's interest here is separate to the industrial interest. It's not in the worker's interest that their labor is devalued. It's not in their interest that there's polluting industries. But the way that capital and government sets it up is that they try to force the, the situation where it's either you have a job that pollutes or you have no job at all. I think that's something to be resisted. Right? In terms of consumption, like, I think it's interesting. I'm doing some work on this at the moment. I think it's really interesting that sort of huge components of what we think of as everyday consumption are actually going to housing bubbles or capital expenditure or actually like, you know, a third of a household expenditure goes on cars, which we think of as things that people use for recreation. But, you know, if you take the average car owner in the UK, drive, spend 77 minutes in their car every week. It's not that much. 66 minutes of which are driving to and from work. The, the other 11 are going to the supermarket. If people had the option of decent public transport, would they really want to spend a third of their income on a, a chunk of metal they don't really need? Okay. I think we've got to be careful here when we talk about like, you know, how much choice do people really have? And is it in their interest to spend their, you know, their hard earned money on stuff to get them to and from work? I think we need to be careful here when we're talking about interests, is all I'd say. I think until th th there is a greater connection for people to understand how th this transition it can support new jobs and how, how crucial it is that um, we, we place um, democracy in the workplace at the heart of this transition, um, it, it's, it's just it's, it's very hard for people to, to, to make these, these links. I, I think this dialogue will start to happen more. People will become more familiar with, with these terms when they see the implications for their workplace. So if, if we have these discussions about what net zero is, what it means for the company I work in or the, the company my friend works in, people will become a lot more knowledgeable about these terms and then be, be able to act on them. I, I wondered if you had, had anything to, act, uh, to, to, to add to that. Is that something that, that you would agree with, that people will sort of gain knowledge about what this transition is just by the process of democratization? Or maybe I've, I've missed the point on, on something there. Well, I think. I think you're like, I think what will happen is as workplaces are transformed, I think it will open up the question of the purpose of the job or the purpose of purpose of work at, at all. And I think we're living in a period where work is coming to question again, and that can only be a positive thing. Ultimately, I think there's going to be, uh, have to be a conversation to be had around how do we reduce working hours? How do we ensure that there is access to uh, um, just and secure and fair forms of work for most people in a world where we need to re overall reduce levels of production. So I think in my mind that the just path there, the sort of the, the eco-socialist path is towards a shorter working week to democracy in the workplace. And I think what we produce and how we produce it under what conditions we produce it will only become a, a, a more common workplace topic as people start to ask what's the purpose of their job i think that's a positive thing i think there are reactionary ways that can go in terms of sort of circling the wagons to defend industries from all criticism they can be complicity often at a sort of a, a very senior level sort of in unions or you can have quite right-wing workplaces workers don't you know, workers have a, a spectrum of political opinions or you can have quite progressive workplaces uh, 
my my personal bet is that the less professionalized a workforce, the, the, um, the more radical they are, the possibilities for that work. I think professionalization tends to lead to conservative political views, which might explain some of our UCU colleagues. But that, that could just be my um, my bias. But I would hope so. Thanks very much. Um, and um, De Declan, I wondered if I, if I could ask you to, to talk a bit more uh, about this submission of COP26 through the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. That, that sounds very interesting. Yes, so um, the submission was, I guess, my initiative um, based on um, my understanding of international law, but also the work that I'm doing with the Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group and the COP26 Coalition. So the COP26 Coalition um, is trade union led effectively. Um, it involves civil society groups and they've made you know, quite radical demands of um, the COP26 um, states parties. Now, I've incorporated that, but um, introduced ideas that would be effectively socialist and well, our socialists and would demand um, a just transformation beyond a just transition. Um, you know, the ownership of the means of production, um, the, the means of consumption in, in a way as well as I, I alluded to earlier. But again, I, I, I feel the law is limited. Um, you know, the real impetus is the latent power of the, the trade union movement and, and workers. Now, I, I definitely accept that there's conflict within the, the trade union movement and within, say, Unite and the GMB in particular, where some of us were campaigning against the expansion of Heathrow and, and others were celebrating whenever the Supreme Court didn't um, allow the initial success to um, persist. And um, the GMB, so I, I'm a member of um, three unions, but the GMB, um, we have this group, GMB for Green New Deal, and the GMB leadership, you know, treat us with um, disdain, particularly in relation to the nuclear industry, defence and um, fossil fuel extraction um, industries. So um, one initiative that I've come up with um, is to set up my own union branch, which um, is part of the Unite Community. Um, and Unite Community is mainly for people who are students, um, unemployed or retirees. And I, I've set up a Unite Climate Justice um, branch. And that is, is a way of trying to fuse the community with the workforce insofar as um, Unite Community can be on the picket lines with the workers and show solidarity there, but particularly in um, communities where um, there, there is a need for just transition and, and there's a, a tight link between the, the, the workforce and the local community, then it can um, bring that sense of solidarity. And to be honest, step outside the restrictive trade union laws. But um, in essence, I, I feel that the law, whether at a national or international level, is not as effective as workers' power, um, whether that's a general strike in India or, you know, the, the way in which the, the great refusal, um, as Nicholas alluded to, can have a, a knock-on societal impact. Thanks very much. Um, may, maybe we could put some links to, to some of these topics in, into the chat um, to, to go with the recording and to share more widely. Um, so about the submission and um, the, the, the great refusal, that's something I've not really he heard of before. I've heard of the, I think it's the, the live flats movement in China. Does it have parallels to that? Is it a similar idea or are there some differences? It's quite, uh, sorry. It's just quite literally the name they've given to um, the last like two, three months of activity in the work. It's sort of large in the hospitality retail sector in the US. Um, post like sort of down the winding end of the pandemic, but it's also that um, there's a fantastic Reddit thread. It's called anti-work. It's like the anti-work thread on Reddit, um, which is people posting conversations they have with their boss over the last couple of months, like the screenshots on Reddit. It's quite, it's quite entertaining to see what I've seen happening. 
it's just a general res like refusal of the, the really shitty conditions that usually US workers have to have or do have in retail and hospitality, which is when you see some of the conversations people post that they have with their boss, it's quite, like it's quite incredible what people get away with. Or well, not anymore, I guess. Do we have time for a, for a last um, point of conversation? Uh, do you mind? Do you have I time actually have to go, unfortunately. Digging? I have to go, unfortunately. Okay. Well, that's a pity. But maybe with that one, we can uh, keep going for other five minutes. What do you think, that one? It's okay with me, but uh, I'm not sure Nicholas can stay. Yeah, well, I, I thank Nicholas. If he needs to go, uh, it's fine. We can we can stay five more minutes. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, guys. My day. apologies for having my apologies for having to leave, but I am on um, solo dad duty, so yeah. I'm gonna go solo dad. No problem. Thank you so much, thanks, Nicholas. Nicholas. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, so my, my last uh, point of conversation uh, I th um, is related to Scientist Rebellion, uh, which is an organization, as you probably already know, that um, is, is, um, is very much active alongside uh, other groups like Extinction Rebellion. And one of the core demands is this, that this just transition we've been talking about um, will happen through uh, degrowth as a mechanism and that besides that there will be a redistribution of wealth in order to achieve this uh, uh, just transition. What do you think about this? Do you think know, knowing what you know uh, as an insider in, in the trade union movement, do you think is something that is realistic that is possible? Well, um, I think it's necessary um, and it is possible. It, you know, it requires political will and um, understanding and, and education because I think, you know, we all saw where the um, insulate Britain protesters were in conflict with certain people going to work. And, you know, that's... Um, you know, a question of lack of understanding of the emergency that we're in, I feel. But that, that is related to the, the need for degrowth um, in a way that um, Nicholas referred to as well. So I think that we, we need um, a general reduction in our um, GDP or standard of living so perceived in the sense that, um, you know, we should have a, a four day week or less and the way in which that um, translates is to hopefully have a, a rising standard of living in, in the global south, um, because you know we, we do over consume and we, we do overproduce. So you know I, I don't agree with the, the measure of GDP. I, I think we um, should have a degrowth strategy, and then that would hopefully align with the. A rising um, living standard for the for the global south. I think it sounds like like it. We can wrap it up. And um, after Nick left us, uh, I I can thank Declan uh, for having joined us uh, and you know for this very interesting uh, elements on. Uh, uh, the, the legal aspects and the, the role of trade unions that I think is very much enriching um, the, the type of uh, information we've been providing with uh, COP view. So thanks very much, Devlin, and um, thanks everyone for joining us. We try and make uh, the recording available as soon as possible. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks again and uh, have a good day.